On May 11th of 2020, my colleague in philosophy at the Catholic University, Brad Lewis, and I published in Public Discourse an essay titled Bullish on the Common Good? Question mark, in which we responded to the increased frequency of calls by some Catholics for a return to the common good in American politics. Often these calls arise in the context of specific policy recommendations or hot button issues, like investment in the US manufacturing sector, or against pornography and transgenderism, or for greater governmental control over the rise of big tech. But equally often, these calls arise as general invocations for the common good against libertarian or classical liberal politics. The contemporary critique, critique of liberalism, titled illiberalism, differs little, in my judgment, from its predecessors, perhaps only by having a social media cauldron in which to curate followers, advance slogans, and boil emotions in the name of one's politics. But as Yves Simone wrote shortly after the war, to blaspheme the name, excuse me, the divine name of freedom at the same time that one condemned the false philosophy of liberalism was the easiest course to pursue, the course which demanded the least mental effort and the least courage. So Christians, Simone contended, cannot be on the side of those against freedom. Instead, they must be involved of the, in the defense against, and this is a quotation, an effort to con conquer freedom which is renewed every day. The key to the defense of freedom, as Simone said then, and as the popes have repeated over and over, is to reaffirm John 8, 32, and ye shall know the truth, and the truth shall set, set you free. The spirit of freedom has no worse enemy than falsehood. The conquest of freedom in daily life invo involves, above all else, a daily fight against falsehood. That fight is long and hard and requires the tools of the philosophical and theological trades. When done well, this fight, as McIntyre once said in the class I took with him, this is a boring struggle and not the stuff of slogans and campaigns. Today I want to advance the claim that the sum total of our disagreements, and I apologize for that completely you know, trite uh, little <laughs> game there, uh, the sum total of our disagreements is not to be found in theoretical disagreements about the common good, but about the role of practical reasoning in politics, which I take to be practical reflection upon the requirements of the common good. Some who invoke the common good uh, do so to short circuit political disagreement permitted today by the church in its understanding of the political common good, which in turn relates to her understanding of the modern state and the human being. We disagree, in other words, because some appeal to the common good to end political disagreement by the exercise of state power in defense of their conception of the common good. To be clear, they do not hide that agenda, okay? They do not hide the agenda that joins the invocation of the common good to overriding liberal institutions by which people contend over uh, the common good. A liberalism or post-liberalism has become the banner under which this project advances. Opposed to this is some 70 years of church teaching and sometimes res uh, both regard and esteem for the potential of liberal institutions of democratic governance to limit states in their tendencies to become despotic. Those liberal institutions include, among other things, universal adult suffrage, guarantees of individual rights of human beings, including especially the right to religious freedom, and respect for the rule of law before which all stand as equals. Respect for these institutions enables and encourages a participatory politics engaged in practical reasoning about the conditions necessary for the fulfillment of particular and social goods. By its nature, such practical reasoning will always involve disagreement, argument when done well, and conflict when done poorly. And that practical reasoning will always thereby implicate the exercise of authority and freedom. Again, following Simone, we, we must acknowledge that the essential question for every social group is that of combining rightly the forces of authority and liberty. Our task in exploring the common good is to do so in as truthful, truthful a manner as possible, 
respectful of disagreement across a wide spectrum of views, and cognizant of the uses to which our arguments are put by those looking for kindling for the cauldron's fire. This task today will involve looking at some of the ways the church has moved beyond the state as the locus of thinking about the common good. So to clear the decks a little bit for this conversation, I want to return really quickly to the, uh, the essay that Brad and I um, wrote that was published in uh, Public Discourse. There we made three points. Uh, the first was that the disagreement between Maritan and Deconic had, in some circles, taken on an outsized significance. In our opinion, Maritan and Deconic largely agreed with one another about the common good and their few differences mattled, mattered little to pol practical political considerations, which is where much of the disagreement remains. In other words, if they were in disagreement, it is a mirror image of our own today. Mar Maritan and Deconic did not disagree in theoretical or speculative claims about the common good, but, uh, but at the level of practical reasoning about the character of the common good. Our view, on this excuse me, our view on this agreement between them is shaped in part by Simone's opinion expressed in his 1944 Review of Politics essay on Deconic's essay. In Deconic's essay, Simone identified five uncontroversial and agreeable propositions about the common good. Simone suggested there that he, Maritan, and Deconic had no issue with these propositions they were not the source of disagreement between them, and nor do I uh, count them as a source of disagreement among us here today. And, and of those five, I think Father Aquinas spoke of at least three of those yesterday, and probably all five of them were alluded to. A second point we made towards the end of our article is that efforts to abandon the common good because of the particular challenges of, mo of modernity are also mistaken. And I don't think this is a concern of anybody in this room but we're probably aware um, there's an emergent temptation of non-Catholics and some Catholics as well to abandon any talk of the com uh, common good or e the idea of the common good. We wrote, no one would want to live in a political community that did not in some important way aim at the good of all of its citizens rather than just a few, or that was seen as a purely neutral means to the self-realization of atomized individuals. The common good is the goal of political institutions and practices, and the modern state must be limited by it. So whatever the relevance for political re reflection of modern difference of the state do not, in my view, count against the fact of there being a common good of even the modern bureaucratic state. In this, we agree as well with those who argue that no state can remain neutral about some conception of the good. So instead, I think, Contemporary invocations of uh, the common good, Brad's and my essay, and responses to it are animated by something that we wrote towards the end, where we said, sometimes it is suggested that even if one concedes that contemporary liberal democracy, excuse me, liberal societies have some notion of the common good, as I just did, that notion is too attenuated to pass muster by means of comparison to the more traditional ideal. The common good should be understood as the life of virtue ordered to the ultimate good or God. This was certainly the, the point of Deconic's argument. But the fact is, large and internally diverse modern societies simply do not have enough agreement on these goals to make them general guides for public policy. A feature of la large modern societies is their comfort with a staggering number of diverse competitive worldviews. Any advocacy for the conception of the common good as ordered to God has to take that pluralism into account in a way, say, which Aristotle and Thomas did not. Okay? This point rests, obviously, upon an assertion about the modern state and a related claim about the capacity of the state to instantiate what is often referred to as a thicker conception or a thick conception of the common good, but I think might better be called a sacralized conception of the common good one that reintegrates the juridical order of the church with the state. We, supply, we find support for our third point in the church's adoption of another way of characterizing the common good, which it has done consistently and repeatedly since the middle of the 20th century. So to some extent, right, I'm trying to vindicate uh, the language of the common good um, that we've already heard, the, the modern formulation of the common good that we've heard uh, referenced to earlier um, yesterday. We think the church's reformulation of the common good 
which one can actually think of, I think, you know, I, I, I'm not making this argument here, but I might be interested in making this argument as a kind of development of social doctrine, right? We think the church's reformulation of the common good is done in part to address the differences between the modern state and prior political communities and to associated claims about the human person. The church's characterization of the common good does not, I think, contradict Thomas's, nor is it irrelevant to practical political considerations. Instead, I think a good case can be made that the reformulation is a drawing out of the implications of the classic Thomistic doctrine, given the particular circumstances of our age. Thus, the church's conception of the common good, which you all know, right, as the sum of conditions leading to the flourishing of persons and their social groups, cautions against inflated expectations from the state. Likewise, the reformulation of the common good cautions against idealizing prior juridical arrangements between the church and state that the church has arguably long since disavowed in no small part because of her own concern about how that relationship damaged her witness. Such claims find support in nearly all of church teachings in the middle, since the middle of the 20th century and I believe are consistent with the claims Simone identified as grounds of agreement among him, Maritan, and Deconic. So I take it as uncontroversial, um, and, but maybe it is controversial. I take it as uncontroversial that the starting point of our considerations about the common good needs to be magisterial teaching on the common good. Church teaching, uh, as many of you know, uh, since Mater et Magistra and up to and through Laudato Si, inclusive of the catechism and, as Russ pointed out, the compendium, continually defines the common good in this, some version of this modern formulation as the sum of those conditions of social life that allow social groups and their individual members relatively thorough and easy access to their own fulfillment. Though unpoetic and often restated, this definition has remained remarkably stable for 70 years, and its wording therefore merits close attention. Such an emphatic, consistent restatement of the common good by the magisterium cannot be ignored. So let's start with some of the elements of it. Let's take you know, a quick, quick look at some of the elements. The common good uh, as a sum of conditions suggests a, a quantitative aspect, right? Something, of course, that is repugnant given you know, everything that we talked about yesterday. An adding together of a plurality of conditions and perhaps even more frustrating, an instrumentality for conditions are always spoken of in terms of the thing you know, to which the conditions point. In this case, the fulfillment of individuals and social groups. To speak then of the common good of a, as a sum of conditions for some end, it seems clear, is to cease speaking of it as an end in its own right and to regard it as instrumental, to regard it in instrumental or worse, even utilitarian terms. In addition, the language suggests a different role for the state, or what we might call public authority. Instead of being the guarantor of the attainment of the common good explicitly ordered to God, the state is reduced to the caretaker, caretaker of the maintenance of the conditions by, hum, by which human persons and groups pursue their goods. Taken together, the language of the definition seems a significant departure from even a debasement of the classical conception of the common good as the defined end of a community of persons towards and by which their activity is ordered, justi justified, and measured. A sum of conditions, even of the sort that leads to personal and social fulfillment, is not, of the, is not the sort of thing that one invokes to inspire minimal sacrifice let alone the, the sorts of sacrifice political communities routinely inspire in the name of their good. Nonetheless, the conditions of the common good remain closely connected to the flourishing or the fulfillment of persons and social groups. As Brad notes, the Latin word for, fulfill for fulfillment in the definition is perfectio. The language of perfection pushes against the apparent debasement of the concept arising from its instrumentality. For while some of conditions thins out the de definition in comparison to the older concept, retention of the language of perfection restores the bar to its divine height. The sum of conditions spoken of in the new definition is ordered towards the noble end achievable by human being 
human beings as individuals and in groups, the fulfillment of persons and their social groups is not reducible to whim. It is not reduced, reducible to subjectivity. It's, and it does set the context for ordering and evaluating any uh, society's attainment of these conditions. I think it's also important to note that the definitions don't reduce the common good to these conditions. The clearest expression of this comes in Gaudium et Spes 74, where we're told the common good embraces, the language is the summa, right, the, the sum total, the summa of these conditions, right, it's not merely these conditions. The language of perfection thus echoes the classical conception of the common good related to the communitas perfecta, alone capable of fulfilling the nature of human beings as social beings, and the conditions therefore are not just any conditions, but those connected to true human goods of persons and their social groups. And therefore, they can continue to be ordered and measured quite concretely in terms of their achievement of those goods. All of these conditions must be ordered towards genuine human fulfillment. Public authority remains beholden to their concrete expression at every moment of any society's life. The political community serves this common good, which includes this summa of conditions necessary to social life. So for instance, a political community's hostility or congeniality towards the natural good of religion is a measure by which to judge the community's provision of these conditions necessary to human flourishing. In the words of Gaudium et Spes, right, the paragraph was 74 I was looking at right now, this is 76, shortly after providing the reformulation of the common good, it says, at all times and all places, the church should have true freedom to preach the, uh, the faith, to teach her social doctrine, to exercise her role freely among men, and to also to pass moral judgment in those matters which regard public order when the fundamental rights of a person or the salvation of souls require it. This is demanding uh, from the state nothing less than the church's freedom to make use of the temporal order for the sake of preaching and living the gospel. Any political community failing to protect this freedom would be failing in terms of the common good. In other words, such a political community, such a state would be despotic by that failure. Further, all forms of the definition closely connect the flourishing of individuals and social groups to each other, suggesting an attempt is being made to avoid lapsing into an individualistic conception of the common good by embedding the definition within the classical understanding of the human being as a social creature. The common good of the new formulation is not an aggregation of particular goods, nor is it a good of the common alien to the good of individual humans. The context of the definitions, again, makes clear this attempt right, to link these things. So for instance, in the catechism, the reformulation of the common good comes at num number 1907, right after in 1905, reminding us of man's social nature. The common good is no, bo even in this reformulation, is no bonum alienum. Criticisms of the newer formulation then cannot easily claim that it's overly individualistic. Both the language and the context of the uh, formulation adhere to the social nature of, the hu of human beings. The common good as described by the Vatican II formulation does not depart either from the communicability or the sociality aspects of the classic formulation of the common good. The sum of conditions necessary for human flourish flourishing is communicable to other human beings and not diminished by their participation in it. And the common good really is common in the sense of being genuinely good for both individuals and social groups at the same time. The political common good is the end of coordinated action that serves the good of both the community as, of, as a whole and the goods of each member of that community in particular. Thus, the common good does not identify some end of collective activity to which some individual ends must be sacrificed as though the good in common can only be be pursued at the expense of the good of some, of, of goods of some. The common good is the good of all and of each in particular. The common good is both one in the sense of indivisible and universal in the sense of serving the good of every particular member of that community. When po political communities fail to pursue the common good, they diminish their members flourishing. And likewise, when the members of political co 
communities fail to order their activities toward the common good, when the, uh, not only do they undermine their own flourishing, but they also diminish the community of which they are a part. So if we grant that the reformulation strives to retain the essence of the classical common uh, good formulation, we're left to wonder why. Why the church has seen fit to advance a reformulation at all? Why not just keep speaking of the common good in classical terms? Again, I think the context of the reformulation provides guidance. Generally speaking, when the common good is referred to, it is usually done accompanied by claims that on the one hand assert some limitations on the activity of the state and on the other refer to the human person. Two quick examples. In Gaudium et Spes 26, the new formulation is introduced in the context of the common good of the entire human family, perhaps the giganticism problem, right? But this is the context in which in 26, this formulation is first introduced in Gaudium et Spets. The common good, we are told, this is a quotation, today takes on an increasingly universal complexion and consequently involves rights and duties with respect to the whole human race. Every social group must take account of the needs and legitimate aspirations of other groups and even of the general welfare of the entire human family. The document then immediately speaks of the dignity of the human person, his universal and inviolable rights, and the necessity of his being provided all the material conditions that conduce to his attainment of the common good. This definition is clearly not uh, contained, excuse me, clearly not claiming that these material conditions are the common good. They are included in the common good. Not a betrayal, I think, then, of the classical formulation, but a specification or a deepening of it given the circumstances. A second vigorous example of recent teaching, uh, teaching's effort to limit the activity of the state in the context of talking about the common good comes up, as Russ knows real well, in Centesimus Annus, where Pope John Paul, says, uh, John Paul II says of Rerum Novarum, that though Pope Leo XIII there calls on the state to address the common good on behalf of the laborer, and here's the quotation, this should not, however, lead us to think that Pope Leo expected the state to solve every social problem. On the contrary, he frequently insists on necessary limits to the state's intervention and, you know, more, more infamously, on its instrumental character inasmuch as the individual, the family, and society are prior to the state, and inasmuch as the state exists in order to protect their, their rights and not stifle them. We see in John Paul II's stark terms an instrumental role for the state. It serves the goods of individuals and the groups pursuing their goods. Okay, related to this move, recasting the uh, relationship with of the common good with the state is a complementary insight into the human person and the particular ways by which the contemporary state can actually impede the person's attainment of his or her end. On the one hand, as an instrument for the attainment of the conditions necessary for human flourishing, the state has a necessary and irreplaceable function in human fulfillment. There remains a common good as the conditions of human flourishing expressible only in the state and this includes, but is not reducible to conditions like political stability, the rule of law, the communications of values and beliefs across perspectival and ideological differences, and certain material conditions, including economic, labor, and health concerns, often expressed in terms of human rights. Thus, the contemporary formulation of the common good towards which all politics, including the politics of state, are ordered, legitimate, and measured, and an emphatic defense of the freedom of the church. But on the other hand, features particular to the modern state serve as obstacles to human flourishing, and many of these features are unfortunately and indefinitely embedded in the state in its current form. They have led, the church warns, over and over to new forms of despotism. Foremost among these has to be the unparalleled extension of state power into nearly every citizen's lives or life. Uh, empowered by staggering developments in science, politics, and technology, modern states possess a formative governing capacity previously unimagined or reserved only for the gods. The, that power extends to all of creation in its most minute elements. The potential shaping of the human 
possessed by the state is boundless and godlike. The comparison of the common good to, of the polis to the divine is as old as Greek philosophy, but that comparison was to the analogically divine attributes of society, including its virtual immortality, its plenitude, and its ability to perform by common action things almost human, almost superhuman. Political society, however, is not today distinguished by virtual immortality, the generational extension of society and time, but a spatial and even an, imagin even an imaginative exhaustiveness. The modern state's reach extends into almost every corner of human experience. No citizens escape its bureaucratic and technical reach, and few as individuals or even social groups can navigate its complex sea lanes of agencies, rules, laws, and regulations. The state's capacity for an actual exercise of coercive, coercive oppression is unprecedented. To be clear, this capacity is indifferent to the political form of the state. Illiberal China offers an excellent example of the actualization of this capacity, just as liberal United States offers perhaps an excellent example to its potential to activate this capacity or incre you know, increased, or maybe increased activization of this capacity, depending on how you read things. But the state's exhaustiveness is not merely the function of technical means and technological prog progress. It is a consequence also of secularization that has diminished the importance of religion proportional to the state's exaltation of its own powers of explanation, meaning provision, and needs satisfaction. The state has substituted itself for all alternative sources of meaning and explanation, in particular in its articulation of itself as the engine of an uh, inevitable process of efficiency, reliability, and predictability. The expansion of knowledge, the perfection of tec tec technical means, the regularity of progress, and the predictable predictability of outcomes the state alone assures. The state is infallible. Failures instead are the result of user error, individual human action confounding the, state judge, the state's judgments or those of its representatives. These features of the modern state, I think, have been visible for the past 11 months by its imposition of a monolithic conception of health around which it has organized all of our social lives. A commonality of modern states is over-governing. The assumption of tasks before left to more local groups and alternative institutions. States fail, authority fails, when it assumes tasks the, governs, the governed can complete on their own. By the exercise of its power, states can retard and have retarded the apt development of human freedom necessary to the attainment of virtue. States have thus become despotic, as the popes have reminded us in previously unimaginable ways, subjecting their populations to new forms of servitude. In his excellent reflections on authority, Simone wrote of the imperialistic tendency of, of authority, which he attributed above all to the state. This insight has led the state, excuse me, the church over time to a rejection of both the claims of ab absolutism and sovereignty associated with the state and to a development of the church's position on participatory politics and liberal institutions, even if she continues to reject doctrinaire liberalism, which she clearly does. Since at least Immortality Day in 1888, the church has acknowledged the legitimacy of democratic participation and self-governance, with Pope Leo XIII writing against those Catholics believing democracy must condemned, quotation, no one of the several forms of government is, it, is in itself condemned, inasmuch as none of them contains anything contrary to Catholic doctrine. And all of them are capable, if wisely and justly managed, to ensure the welfare of the state. Neither is it blameworthy in itself in any manner for the people to have a share, greater or less, in the government. For at certain times and under certain laws, such participation may, may not only be a benefit to the citizens, but even, an, even be an obligation. That hesitating and negative formulation, right, neither is it blameworthy in itself, has long since been eclipsed in Catholic teaching with the trumpeting of the expansion of political and economic participation 
for many decades. Indeed, as an example, no pope has made the connection between the rise of democracy and Christian faith as clearly as Pope Benedict, who both championed democracy as connected to Christianity and thus warned, for instance, against the difficulties of its exportation to Muslim societies, right? Right, he's championed democracy as connected to Christianity, and he's championed freedom of worship as the basis of, of all human rights and a check against the modern state's tendencies towards despotism. In language echoing Augustine's description of how the city of God makes use of the earthly city, the, the church has declared the autonomy and, and independence of the political community and the church. The church makes use of this independent political community for her preaching the truths of the gospel. And by her teaching and the witness of the faithful, the church respects and promotes, promotes the political freedom and the responsibility of citizens. That's Gaudium at Spes 76. But the church never places her hopes in any privilege according to it by civil, accorded to it by civil authority. Indeed, she will give up the exercise of certain legitimately acquired rights whenever it becomes clear that their use will compromise the sincerity of her witness or whenever new circumstances require another arrangement. And all of this language of circumstances, I think, is really important, right? There's clearly like an effort here to be very circumstantially um, aware, right? Cognizant of what the circumstances require, both of the church, political communities, and so on. We should not, however, confuse the defense of freedom of worship with an indifference to the good of faith for persons or their communities. <clears throat> the refusal at one level, right, of social or political organization, the refusal of, uh, at one level to recommend or even impose certain forms of religious belief may be done precisely to allow its recommendation and even imposition at some other level of human organization including most obviously the family and within the churches themselves. All these considerations about the state are offered to help account for the reformulation of the common and good in a way that is less dependent upon the state for its expression and defense. All of them, of course, can be contested and taken alone. They do not suffice to account for the, for the move from the classic to the uh, modern formulation of the common good. They are part of explaining the modern formulation formulations avoidance of a thick conception of the common good in referring to the state or a, or a sacral conception. As Brad writes, the analogical aspect of the common good means that one can see it as encompassing wider or more, more narrow contexts that allow us to apply it to the political environment of the modern state in a somewhat thinner and more formal sense than one, than one might apply in other communities. The essence of the common good consists in shaping political reasoning towards the good of the entire community, suggesting, should, su suggesting even and making intelligible those cases where individual goods may have to be sacrificed for its sake. This points back, of course, to the classic conception of the, co of the primacy of the common over a particular good as a point, of a point of agreement between all of us. Even in our liberal atomized, a atomized age, People understand and are willing to sacrifice for all kinds of goods beyond themselves. Simone writes, people of debased conduct and skeptical judgment still find it natural to die for their country. Indeed, one could argue the durability of this natural inclination explains much of the experience meaninglessness in our time when people are not afforded the opportunities to make these sacrifices. Unless given good reason to assume otherwise, we are not in a position to think our peers are failing to direct their lives around communal goods. Just as the profession of one's doctrine of the common good is not equivalent to pursuing the common good, failure to profess the common good does not equate to failing to seek it. Okay? Want me to read? Should I repeat that one? I'm pretty fast, right? I, I read from, I'm from New York, my apologies. Just as the profession of one's doctrine of the common good is not equivalent to pursuing the common good, failure to profess the common good does not equate to failing to seek it. Sure, there are disagreements about what regard for the common good requires in each and every case, and there remain real questions about the overlap of different communities and their goods in which we find ourselves. But those disagreements are not generally about whether to care for the common good. They are instead about the character 
of the common good. Every day, millions of Americans engage in all sorts of behavior indicating regard for the common good. They go to work, which can be as obviously common good oriented as serving in the military and fire and police departments, as nurses, and a range of civil service jobs. They scrimp and save for their children and their children's children. They pay their taxes. They send their children to school or school them themselves. They engage in local and less local politics, often fighting hard for, th hard for things ranging from dog parks to national defense and China policy. And they almost universally accept their political losses with perspective, perseverance, and determination. Even in a year as crazy as the one that just passed, the vast majority of Americans are back to doing all the sorts of things that evince concern for the goods of the communities they inhabit. No doubt many of us are confounded by the varied ways Americans evince those concerns. We experience a multitude of conflicting views about how to achieve the, condi how to achieve the conditions necessary for human flourishing. Prior to factoring in either the differences in modern social experiences of moral and cultural and religious pluralism or the emergence of the human being as a subject or person, simple acknowledgement of good faith disagreement rooted in perspectival differences alerts us to the challenges associated with life and community. Even within a family, differences of perspective counsel intelligibly for different prudential judgments on how to serve the family's good. Yet when thinking about the character of the, of the common good of a co concrete community, many of us often desire its character to express our own. And when it does not, our, impatient, our impatience leads us into concluding co concern for the common good has been forsworn. The failure, we think, isn't one of prudential judgment, but lack of concern for the common good. We have failed in these instances to distinguish the concrete requirements of the common good, in this case, for, the, for concern for the common good generally. For the just, perhaps, right, for the virtuous, perhaps, no such distinction is necessary. There will be no gap between their insight into the demands of the common good in this case and their love for the common good. As Simone writes of the just, the volition and the intention of the common good are guaranteed by virtue. For the rest of us, however, there will be some gap. In other words, for the rest of us, we can distinguish between materially and formally willing the common good. A thing can appear as good or bad, depending upon points of view. So long as a thing is good in one respect and bad, and bad in another respect, there is nothing wrong about its being desired by one to whom it is related in its desirable aspect and hated by the other who happens to occupy such a position as to regard the thing in its undesirable aspect. So we have to assume the worst about our fellow citizens, about our peers, our colleagues, if we think they do not formally intend the common good when they deeply disagree with, it, disagree with us about its material requirements. And when we appeal to the common good to resolve this disagreement, as though by that appeal we can erase the gap between materially and informally intending the common good, erase, in other words, the very real, predictable, and quite common occurrence of disagreement among men and women of imperfect virtue, they rightly intuit a bad faith move on our part, one that skips over the practical reasoning about the common good in which we're all supposed to be engaged, in favor of restricting their freedoms so we can impose our own imperfect conception upon them. This is no doubt why so many perceive so-called common good conservatism as contrary to the common good because not respectful of their freedom to participate in political deliberation. In other words, they perceive our appeals as despotic, formally intending not the common good, but the good of those of us advancing it. We are, in other words, seeking a shortcut around the hard work required by life and community. The unpardonable sin of intellectuals, or of our intellectuals, Simone wrote, is to have chosen the road of minimum effort and minimum generosity. So far as I can tell, 
our peers are right about this. Instead, the work of the church and its social tradition has been that hard work described by Simone, the daily work to strive for the coherence of truth and freedom in its relationship with authority, respectful of the different ways men and women strive to order their lives around the common good. Thank you very much. Okay. Uh, in fact, I published an article years ago making exactly your argument. Fantastic. So I'm, I'm going to tell you what's, what's weak in it. What's right, but what is, what is also weak. Uh, and we, we start with JP2's uh, thing in Centesimus. And so as a matter of fact, I agree with you that that quasi-instrumental view of the political common good is his use of the Gaudium et Spes definition. I think, I think right. that's right. 26 and 74. Yeah, yeah. that's it. Uh, but let me point this out. He never argued that in the case of marriage, family, nation, or church. Never. In fact, on those, and there's enormous writings by John Paul II on marriage, family, nation, and church, he uses the classical definition with some refinements, like he calls them social subjects. But he, he basically means uh, the duplex order, common life, common action, and so forth. So even if you are right that the characteristics of the modern state, and especially as we see it post-1945, yeah. uh, we need a more instrumental, abridged version of bonum commune with regard to the state. JP too never thought we needed one on marriage, family, nation, church. In fact, he defends the concept of nation as a specific social form, in no way like an aggregate. But once again, assuming that you're right, that on, on JP too, and that we should follow suit on that, be more suspicious of applying the classical definition. Uh, what do you make of pontificates since JP two? wanting to make the whole world the object of political virtue. I mean, that's, that, that sounds as, uh, as extreme as anything you can get. I mean, what, if, if you're so uh, apprehensive about the powers, bureaucratic powers of the modern state, you don't want to, you don't want to put the whole world under them. And my right, fourth right. point is this. What do we make of the problem of even the diminished state? The modern state is, is diminished in classical social form, not ending up being exemplary to all of the lower associations, which really do have social form, and that we find marriages, families, nations, and churches becoming just like that aggregate. Can you make that second point? I'm sorry, excuse me, the fourth point again? I'm right. sorry, Russ. Well, it's sort of an exemplary causality. Uh, <clears throat> sure, there are these other social associations that have more of the classical notion of common good in them. And we, and we can see it. I mean, it, it, it's not a theoretical exercise or yeah. a, 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 a difficult one. But human nature being what it is, all of the lower ones are going to imitate the higher one. And if the higher one becomes the kind of aggregate that we have to limit and all the time and change uh, its depth of social form and so forth. Uh, yeah, churches, nations, families, and marriages are going to start looking just like it. They're going to start looking just like a Rawlsian debate about what we can agree on. Sure. And sure. Uh, so uh, yeah. Look, that's I a contingent question. And, and so I raised <coughs> four, and they all agree with your premise. Yeah. I mean, I, I'm not sure I got the first, you know, two either. But I, I thought the first two were more or less agreements. I know. I mean, I, I certainly heard the third one as a kind of question. The fourth one, I'd say, yeah, that's a real problem. I mean, that, that's absolutely a problem. It's and it, it's clearly also a kind of, like you said, a kind of transparent phenomenon, right? That they they are going to mimic these features of this other thing, right? And and they and they are doing that. Um, I think the church. It, you know, continues to counsel against looking to its exempl exemplarity, um, in part by trying to reposition the common good in relationship to the state. Right? Don't look to the modern state for exemplarity, is what I see it saying, despite you know our tendency to to, to do so. Um, the third point was about you know uh, 
the giganticism problem, I think, more or less, yeah. right? And, and maybe you and I are just going to disagree about this at some point, right? Uh, but I don't think you're going to disagree with this. First, there really is a universal human community, right? Um, there really is. Uh, that seems to me to be a, very, a long position um, in classical uh, church teaching, classical theological and ph philosophical teaching. We are members of a human family. This has actually done a lot of work, uh, a lot of good work um, in, our, in our past. Um, I'm thinking, of course, the Spanish scholastics, right, um, and how they you know, encountered the other of the, of the Americas uh, and, and appealing directly to this good of a universal human community. Um, so it, it doesn't seem to me that it's wrong in principle for the church to be pointing to that community needing a political authority appropriate to it. The question will, you know, in my judgment is, or I think we're, we're, we're discussing, is really what is the nature of that going to be? What is it going to look like? And I'm suggesting that just as whatever the political authority of the state is, is going to be more a, an attenuated good, that will be even more attenuated, right? It'll be more formal. Uh, so its specifications will be less clear and more susceptible to disagreement, conversation, argument. But there will be nonetheless things, right, that are appropriate to its considerations. And you know that Pope Benedict, you know, right, he advanced this more than anybody, right, in saying, like, look, the financial, the global financial system is one of those things that it alone can kind of attend to. He, he named also climate, right, as another one of these kinds of things. Uh, and, and those instincts strike me as correct. Um, his instincts on, the, on these questions strike me as correct. But again, I'm not sure like, whether, that, whether the political form to it can ever be much more than the Jus Gentium, right? Some like, contemporized version of the Jus Gentium. In other words, international law of some kind. Um, and I don't mean to be by that sort of endorsing all of international law or the institutions the current to us with regard to international law. Does but that you, get at it? Yeah. Yes, but you would agree that we should. Use the microphone. Yeah, yeah, sorry. You agree that in, in this case of finding a suitable structure of governance that's not, doesn't do more harm than good, uh, we shouldn't be using the word communion about it. Probably not. That's okay. right. Uh, well, look, probably not, right? And, and I am deeply concerned about its inclination towards despotism too, right? Because if it's true of the state, it's going to be even more true of something like this. I think this is where we could actually learn from Protestant theologians, right? Um, who, uh, Helmut Thielicke in the middle of the 20th century referred to it as basically the Antichrist, right? Um, world political authority would be, you know, of its nature, a kind of evil thing. Um, and there's something to be said of that perspective, I think. Thank you. I, I, sorry, I missed the first two. Yes. In the back. Uh, can you hear me okay? I, I really can, a little bit louder. Okay, there we go. Um, great talk. Um, I, I write and study Toke, write on Tocqueville, study Tocqueville, and so lots of echoes with, with what you're saying. Um, Love to hear it. And, um, you know, I think it's interesting. Rawls in Political Liberalism has this footnote where he says that he basically agrees with, with Tocqueville on the idea of a separation of church and state, and I think... You know, lots of Rawlsians will read Tocqueville and, and say Tocqueville is just a Rawlsian. But I think if you if you understand um, actually what Tocqueville has to say about the separation of church and state, um, that's not that's not true at all. Uh, uh, you know, Rawlsian public reason would be anathema to Tocqueville, and all you need to do is read his writings on um, abolition, slavery, and Christianity in America to to understand that. Um, so I'm I'm sort of um, taken with, by what you said about you know John eight thirty two right. Uh, both, both, um, both truth, and then um, um, you know, um, arguing both for freedom and for truth, right? And so, but h how do we go about actually doing that, right? So, so lots of liberals or lots of people who are categorized as liberal, including Tocqueville, will write about, um, you know, in the Ancien Regime, he writes about the liberty of the church and the importance that the church be subjected to its own rules, right? right. And that in the French Revolution, one of the dangers is that the church was not. So, you know, it was, it was being imposed upon, right? Um, as we approach, you know, our political atmosphere today, is it best to argue on your view for, for which of those two? Or in what, in what combination? What way do we go about arguing? Which, which two again? Um, truth and freedom. 
truth and freedom. So if we're concerned with the, with the church as a society being free to pursue the truth, do we argue on the basis of the freedom of the church or should we argue for the truths that the church itself promotes? Um, thinking about you know the equality act or other things that are coming forward how 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 might we effectively argue so that's my that's my okay right so okay okay. so i mean my first response is going to be the easy one which is say well why are we choosing one or the other right Mm -hmm. we're we're clearly not but what i I think what you're really asking um or maybe what you're expressing is a kind of dissatisfaction with or wondering whether we should be dissatisfied with what has been an approach in our community to argue merely for religious liberty and to just basically stop arguing about the substantive claims we want to make, right? Whether it's mm-hmm. about contraception, mm-hmm. right? I mean, contraception is the one nobody argues about, right? But mm-hmm. we all kind of claim we believe it's you know right not to contracept. Um, uh, look, I, I think I think we have to stop proceeding as Rawlsians, right? Who are basically like, look, we're only going to argue. Um, on the basis of certain kinds of procedural rules that have been decided by somebody else. And we argue um, all of the above when it's appropriate, right? And, you know, and, and, and not be satisfied um, if, the, if, it's, if we're never permitted to make it appropriate to argue substantive claims. So uh, uh, yeah, I think one of, the, one of the failings of the past 25 years or so has been precisely only to appear like we're caring about trying to carve out, stake out free, free space for us to do our thing and not actually advancing um, positions that substantively might challenge the views of other people, that might actually move them, um, that will sharpen our own cases for them, and so on. So, um, I mean, am I getting at, like... Yeah, y- yeah, yeah, absolutely, <clears throat> absolutely. I think, you know... Um, Arguments about religious liberty, um, in, in, in my view, arguments about religious liberty are, are well and good because we want to respect the particularity right. of right. that society, just right. as we want to respect the particularity right. of parental authority, whether that set of parents be Catholics or not, right? right? We want to respect that as a, as a right. precept of the natural law. Um, but at the same time, um, it seems if we if we really do believe in, in the precepts of the natural law, um, there, are, there are truths that we should argue for um, on the basis of being truths that might actually win people for Inclu- the church. Right, and, and including the, the truth that we believe is of the natural law about the natural religious nature of the human person, right? Like this is not something that y- people can't understand, right? You could, social science even can kind of support mm-hmm. this assertion, and I'm, not, and I'm no huge fan of social science, right? So I, I, look, I absolutely agree with that. But part of what I was getting at with regard to the tr- appeal to truth too was a little bit to tweak some people in our own circles, right? Where what I fear is, and this is something, again, Simone writes about, is that too often what happens among people like us, right, is that we just nod our heads in agreement with each other because we're all on the same side, and we don't actually say, no, that's actually not right. Like, you know, or, you know, that, that position, I mean, you can do a better job of arguing this, you know, and one of our tasks is to call ourselves, right, right, to always be truthful and, and I mean, there's, so, so there's that element of like purifying our arguments, as Benedict might say. Um, but then there's also the, I, th- I hope, the unwillingness to embrace a kind of crass political approach to things by which we don't really care, right, what arguments we make so long as we win, you know, whether it's votes or, you know, something else, right? I mean, that's, that's a disservice, I think, ultimately to us in the long run. But that's maybe something that Matthew and I will talk yeah. about more. And, <clears throat> thank you for your question. Thank you. Um, no, thank you for your paper. I one of the the questions that uh, that you've raised for me is in, in looking at the 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 yeah more contemporary the church's more contemporary description of of the yeah. of the common good uh, and trying to uh, uh, come to terms with it. It seems to me that. It stands as a kind of totem, maybe, for uh, not just a change in the conversation, but a real shift in, in perspective as to what political reality is. So, f- for example, if if before, uh, like the the real drama of of the political community was how do the societies of family, city, and church come together, you know, for the flourishing of of all three of those societies 
Uh, it seems that the newer description of the common good is an admission that, and maybe without a kind of admission, without admitting it publicly, that that not only is that no longer uh, the political reality that we all deal with, but we've entered a new phase where it's really just the individual and the state. Uh, and we define things now in such a way as to, as I think a lot of your paper did, just how, how do you mitigate kind of overreaching political authorities, you know, for the protection of, of individuals? That's not now, that's now the drama that we, we find ourselves in. Yeah. Uh, and I guess some people would question whether, um, yeah, the experience of the 20th century and totalitarianism, the experience of the two world wars and, and all of that, um, warrants that kind of shift, whether that even in the kind of the, the post-totalitarian world, if, uh, as, as Russ was saying yesterday, I mean, discussion of, of real concrete communities, of, of family, city, uh, and church, um, whether the, the abandonment of that has, in fact, weakened our position uh, in terms of, of dealing with uh, contemporary realities, or, in fact, have we just then adopted or just accepted um, the uh, perversions, for lack of a better term, of, of, of the 20th century as a kind of norm that now just has to be negotiated. And so things like liberty, carve-outs, you know, all of those individual rights or the kinds of things we seek now uh, to protect us from uh, overarching uh, political authority instead of having a more positive conversation as to what, in fact, are we trying to achieve together? Um, that, that, yeah, so your, your reaction to, yeah, look, to, to that. There's a, Father, there's a ton there, right? And, and, and much I'm sympathetic to. I, you know, it's the kind of thing that we, you know, we really have to get in it. Um, you know, maybe, maybe we can actually go back to this in a later conversation, right? Um, so I, I, first of all, I, I don't think the church is abandoning um, those social forms, right, or by adopting this language, um, conceding things. Uh, I think instead what she's trying to do is, uh, in essence, almost like depoliticize human beings and their social groups, right, uh, and it, almost in an anti anticipation of a trend that we seem almost, to be, in my judgment, like to be coming to the end of, right, where we are so overly politicized, right, that we can't help but think of ourselves in political terms, right, as individuals or uh, associations of men and women. Um, so so I, I think it's it's striving to push against this by this language. And, and that's where, I, you know, I think ultimately I'd like to make the case that what Look, we're, we have to work with this language. I mean, that's that's an, right. That I, we have to work with the language that we're given by the magisterium, and and I want to push the case that I think what they're trying to do is deepen the um, the classical conception of the common good. Or, I mean, another way might be able, might possibly to put it is they're trying to bridge that gap between speculative claims about the common good and practical claims about the common good, and they're and they're doing this by forking us, forcing us to look at circumstances, right? And what the circumstances in these situations require um, and how they also pertain to the levels of participation of human beings as individuals and as social groups because, the, because their actual participation in these goods will be partly determined by what kinds of groups they are, you know, and, and specified by those. So anyway, you, everything you said is right in terms of this is what we're, this is the challenge. Um, I, I, I just, I think the church is not conceding here. I think she's actually trying to give us the equipment um, to resist, <laughs> I mean, uh, you know, which maybe is already conceding. I don't know. Um, Anyway, great question. But um, you mentioned that Simone talks about how the virtuous are the ones who habitually will the common good, right, well. Right. And so I'm, I'm wondering, if I would put it as kind of a challenge, I'm, one, I'm wondering whether you're being overly sanguine about the issue of what does it take in human persons to bring about the proper formal willing of the common good. 
and so I mean, you were you were indicating, well, look, you know, I mean, there's 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 the material differences, but hey, you know, in general, there's a strong natural inclination to put the common over the particular. A great point. And as I'm thinking about it, though, isn't it root that the, the real grounding of the natural inclination to put the common good first? is our natural orientation towards what the true common good is. And to the extent that people are not presented with what the true common good is, seems to me that natural inclination is undermined. And in fact, is, isn't this empirically, as we look around, less and less are people actually really willing the common good. I mean, you can see in them that they have a natural inclination, and so you know, men you know, have the sense of, well, I'll give my life for my country. But at the same time, we see on such an increase now, people just thinking in terms of, I game the political system for me. I mean, is, it can, isn't empirically a willing of the common good just formally dramatically decreasing? And isn't a key way of addressing that the matter of what the true common good is. And this is my concern about, about sidestepping the, the issue of the thick common good and promoting it. It's, it. Well, it's not sidestepping it, right? My, my, my argument is what the churches do is it's relocating, right? That and saying, don't look for this in the state, right? Look for it in these other places. So, I mean, quick response. I am not gonna concede that empirically you and I can tell whether people are not formally willing uh, the common good. I'm not. I, 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 I just don't know. Like, um, every time, or, or we are tempted into concluding that because people will are materially willing different things than we will, right? Um, that, that's essentially my assertion or my claim, right? And you and I, we're both Catholic, we're both fathers of multiple children, I believe, right? We both chop wood, right? We have a lot in common, uh, right? We have a lot in common. Um, but I bet we have very different gr views on how we educate our children, right? Um, perhaps on whom to vote for, you know, and, and some of the things that I do might really vex you and vice versa, right? And one way for us to think about that is to say, well, cut it back doesn't really will the common good, right? Like, you know, he's, he's just, you know, crass um, or something scheming or whatever, right? And, you know, you think the same thing about me, but I, I don't, I'm, I just don't, I don't think that that's right or fair, and I don't really believe that people are more self-interested than they were before. You know, I, that, I mean, it's, it's easy for us to believe that. Um, but, but, but the bigger point you're making really is about, and, and I know we're out of time, I mean, and maybe we'll have to wait about, don't we need to orient these people explicitly towards the true good? I mean, that's the case, D tr explicitly towards the true good. Because I might say, well, look, they are oriented towards it. Many of them don't right, don't perceive it as such or something along those lines. But you're, you're really, I think, right, you want to say, we have to explicitly orient them towards the common good, which is you know, what a you know, certain kind of arrangement, political arrangement, for instance, might be capable of doing. And, and we can discuss that further.